tonight to celebrate it and to celebrate you. So I'm very excited to call the meeting to order. We will start with public comments. So is there anyone who came here tonight to address the school committee about an item not on our agenda? Okay, seeing none, um, I am going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Doherty, and I think he's going to have our principals introduce the teachers that we are honoring this evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this too is one of my favorite meetings of the year. At the beginning of the school year, we welcome all of our new teachers to the district, and we close out the school year by honoring the teachers that have reached significant milestones um, in their career. Um, we have teachers here tonight that have reached professional teaching status, which is a, a very rigorous milestone. Um, we also have teachers here uh, who are uh, entering their, or finishing their 10th year, their 20th year, their 30th year, and who are retiring, which is also a significant milestone. Um, so uh, what I'm going to have uh, is each of our principals um, introduce uh, the people that are here this evening, but also mention the ones that could not make it this evening. So I'm going to start first with uh, the Reading Memorial High School at Principal Adam Barker, who's going to introduce his milestone staff. Janet D, our tech integrator, uh, Paula Graham, our phys ed department head, um, Ms. Valerie O'Brien, secretary, Ms. Patricia Shields, secretary, and Ms. Jeannie Thomas's. She's from our here, special she team. just walked oh. in. Oh. Just walked in. <laughs> going to have um, uh, Ricky Shanklin is actually going to do double duty tonight. He's going to uh, introduce the Parker Milestone staff and the Coolidge Milestone, milestone staff. Um, Ms. Marshawn has a fifth grade parent uh, meeting this evening and was unable to attend. Thank you. So I'll start off with Parker's. Um, our acknowledging our 10 years of service. Um, these people are unable to be with us tonight. 
We have Michelle Anderson. She's a paraeducator for the past 10 years. We have Maria Arthur. She's also a paraeducator for the past 10 years. Brian Cormier, who is our math teacher and math team leader. And Eric Hiltz, who is our phys physical education teacher. For 20 years of service, um, I do not believe either of these two people are here. So, um, Diane Davis, she has been our art teacher. And Donna Martinson, who has taught both sixth and seventh grade English language arts. teacher. We also have Matt Williams who's unable to make it tonight. He is a sixth grade science teacher. We do have one retirement. I have not had the privilege of working with her. She retired um, late at the end of the summer last year and that is Virginia, otherwise known as Ginny Anderson. Um, she worked for many years um, in the Reading Public Schools, including Reading Memorial High School, Coolidge, and then also at Parker. So thank you to Jenny for her service. So we have, for, I'm gonna move on to Coolidge now. So um, for 20 years of service, we have Cheryl Webster. Um, Sarah would like, did want me to say some things about um, each of her teachers, so Cheryl is the fearless leader of our beginning and advanced bands. Her love of music has been passed to Coolidge students for 20 years. They flourish under her guidance and passion for music. She has been the starting point of many a music career, as many of her current and former students can attest. Congratulations to Cheryl for her 20 years of service. <laughs> Professional status teachers. We have Jerry Coyne. Okay. Um, science teacher. We have Lindsay Pinkham. Um, we have Paul Simpson, who's an ELA teacher. Um, Jane White, who is 7th and 8th grade learning center. And Jennifer White, who is a wellness teacher. We have two retirees. We have Sheila Bataro. Sheila Bataro has been at Coolidge for 16 years, during which she has been our reading specialist. Sheila has a wonderful way of creating a safe and caring environment in which students can get the support and ask for the help they need. We wish Sheila well, as we know she looks forward to more time with her grandchildren and more time sailing on her sailboat. Mm -hmm. And I know Connie De Benedetto couldn't be here, but Connie began her tenure at Coolidge as a para in 2002. In 2005, she moved into the position of a science teacher and has never looked back. Her energy and excitement for both science and for her students has created a tone of accountability and caring. We wish Connie well in her retirement and know she looks forward to spending more time with her husband and children. We do hope she is speaking honestly when she says she wants to come back and substitute for us as we would love to have her back. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm gonna have the uh, principal of the Joshua Eaton Elementary School Eric Sprung, introduce <coughs> Milestone staff. Um, so I'm gonna start with the teacher who has earned her professional teaching status. She's unable to be here with us today, but Leanne Atkinson out of our Learning Center uh, who has earned professional teaching status. So a round of applause for Leanne. <laughs> I'd now like to announce the names of some staff members who have been with us for 10 years. We'll start with uh, a person who does it all at Joshua Eaton in the office, who's covering classrooms, uh, being in the cafeteria, and doing it all for us. Joan Clark, come forward for 10 years of service. And we'll, then we'll have the person who has been an amazing support to our kindergarten student, Creed Zerfus, coming forward as a graduate.
and Sue Menard, who could not be with us um, today, has also been with us for 10 years, so thank you to Sue for her time. And we have someone who's been with us for 20 years and is also celebrating her retirement. So Deb Kenton, who's been a wonderful <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to now have Sarah Levesque from the Killam Elementary School introduce her milestone staff. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be up here and celebrate uh, the individuals who are here with us this evening. I'd like to start with our 20 years of service. Uh, Karen Douglas is a current second grade teacher. She's not able to be with us today, but she certainly deserves a round of applause. Mm -hmm. For 10 years of service, um, also unable to be with us today, we'd like to recognize Jessica Bruno, who is a current third grade teacher and is out on maternity leave right now. We hope taking care of her little one at home. <laughs> we have Tony Ann Rocco, who is a current first grade teacher, Cynthia Ryan, who is a current uh, K-5 tutor, and Michelle Tucker, who is a current paraeducator in our therapeutic support program. All are also unable to be with us today. Next, we'd like to recognize those who have attained professional status this year. Karen Hall, our English language learner teacher. teacher and she is unable to be with us this evening. And we'd like to celebrate two retirements at Killam this year. We have Deb Delojo who is here with us this evening, a current second grade teacher who has been educating students for over 28 years. who is our secretary in the building. She has been a member of the Killam family for 36 years. She's unable to be here. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like uh, Julia Hendricks, the principal at Birch Meadow Elementary School, to now introduce her milestone staff. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to start with staff who have had um, completed 10 years of service at the Reading Public Schools. Our speech and language pathologist, Julia Butler, is unable to be here tonight, but she has completed 10 years of service. And then also Melissa Milner, grade 5 teacher, who is going to take the leap and go to grade 3 next year, has completed 10 years. Several teachers who have achieved professional teacher status this year at Birch Meadow. Joining us this evening are Katie Anderson, second grade teacher. <laughs> Talia Hallett, first grade teacher. You get first. Huh? <laughs> you don't get one. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, and Patricia Piacentini, who is the Compass K-2 teacher in our Substantially Separate program. In addition, some of our professional status teachers could not be here this evening. Lorette Cullen, who is a special educator in our Learning Center, working <coughs> primarily with fourth and fifth graders. And Winna Leahy, who is a special educator in our fifth grade. And finally, we have two retirements from Birch Meadow this year. One of them, Christine Underwood, a paraeducator, is unable to be here tonight. 
The other is Maureen Kernauer, who is leaving Birch Meadow from her third grade position. And we are very sorry to see her go, but happy for her next step. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. I'd like to have Joanne King, the principal at Wood End. Please come forward. Good evening. Thank you for having us here this evening. I'd like to recognize a few people from Wood End. So first of all, uh, 10 years of service. She's not able to be here tonight, but Catherine Bjorngard has been a special education parent in our learning center for 10 years, and she's also now in our Crossroads program. to recognize Victoria Liner Wellows, who is a special educator in our learning center. She has also been with us for 10 years. And for 20 years of service, um, she's also not able to be with us this evening, but Rose Salamini has been a regular education para um, and in our kindergarten, um, kindergarten para for over 20 years, so amazing woman. And then I'd like to recognize a teacher who is receiving professional teaching status this evening. That would be Danielle Giannatasio, who started in kindergarten and is now in grade two. So congratulations. <laughs> and certainly saving the best for last. Um, Barbara Sheehan is retiring this year after more than 38 years in the Reading Public Schools. Thank you again to the school committee for letting us celebrate our amazing staff members. Um, I have a staff member who's achieving professional status this year, third grade teacher Kara Engelson. She started her career at Killam for a couple of years and has been with us in Barrows for the past year, and we're excited for her and achieving that milestone. So congratulations to Kara. <laughs> She, Additionally, from our third grade team, Jacqueline Gargano is achieving her 10-year milestone in the Reading Public Schools, so we're excited. Congratulations to Jacqueline, who could also not be with us this evening. So. Um, for someone who many of us rely on and who keep us well, both in our hearts and bodies, Christine Rose, our nurse, is celebrating 10 years of employment for the Reading Public Schools, so Christine, congratulations. <laughs> Also fondly known as Work Mom, my, our school secretary who keeps us running and keeps us going every day and takes care of all of us, Donna Walsh celebrating 20 years. In <laughs> um, and finally, with it is with a sad heart, but I am so excited for her um, in celebrating her retirement, our school psychologist, Denise Carroll, who has brought so much love and support to our school community, to our parents, to our students, and our staff. And we are excited for her and her next step in her journey, and best wishes with her forthcoming grandbaby. So, Denise, congratulations. Denise Carroll. Thank you, Heather. I'd like to have now Debbie Butts come forward as, oh, the first one, yeah. okay, good. I'd like to have now Debbie Butts come forward. I just thought you were saving the best for last. <laughs> no? <laughs> um, I would like to recognize um, Karen Stewart, who's been with Rise Preschool for 10 years. Fun loving, high expectations. <laughs> and Patrice Donahue has been with, Rye, with Reading Public Schools for 20 years. Boudreaux is 
is not here tonight, but she has been with the Reading Public Schools for 20 years. And Anita Hogan is also not here tonight, but she is retiring. I thought I could do myself. No. no. <laughs> I have something to say about myself. Um, Anita, <laughs> Anita Hogan has been with the uh, Reading Public Schools for 27 years in many different uh, roles. So, thank you very much. So Debbie will be retiring at the end of this year. Um, we will miss her leadership and her laughter um, and the work she has done to really continue the great tradition of the Rise Preschool. So we thank Debbie for all that she has done for the Reading Public Schools. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. Krista Morello is now going to introduce some food service milestones. Hi. Uh, we have um, Yvonne Lugo, who works with us at the Killam School, who's not with us tonight, but she is celebrating 10 years with us. Uh, and we have Victoria Kobali from the Eaton School, uh, more formally known as Nasima to us. She technically is here 12 years, but she left and came back, so she's got 10 years. Thank you. have Heather Leonard join me for a minute. Uh, we have a, a little bit of a special uh, honoree tonight, too. Um, we have a woman who works both on um, Heather and myself at the Barrows School, who um, not only is celebrating 10 years with us tonight, but she's also been nominated. Um, she was the only person from Reading nominated this year for the uh, Massachusetts School Nutrition Hero. Um, she didn't win for the state, but it's pretty um, nice to be one of 10. She did, however, when um, for Heather and I nominated her for Manager of the Year. She won the School Nutrition Association Massachusetts Manager of the Year. And anyone who wins that goes on to a regional. Uh, there's seven regions in the country. She won the Northeast Regional Manager wow. of the Year. So um, although she didn't win National Manager of the Year, she is ours. And um, I think you would be dumbfounded about the things she does for the students uh, far beyond food from uh, Heather's wash committee. Oh my gosh, the, <laughs> the list goes on and on. There was no question that yeah. clearly she was, she, she rose was above all she does and there was a lot we couldn't even capture on paper, so. So she'll be joining uh, myself and uh, the school nutrition coordinator, uh, Carlene in Atlanta to walk the red carpet and accept her award nationally. So Diane Ferguson, please join us. <laughs> building committee meeting this evening. Great. Okay. So, I don't believe he's here. John Goodwin, I do not see him, but John Goodwin is earning his uh, 10 years of service pin uh, as a custodian at the Birch Meadow Elementary School. So, he's out there. <laughs> Kevin Doherty uh, is going to be receiving his retirement apple. Uh, Kevin actually retired in April um, after a successful career at both the high school and he finished his uh, career at uh, Joshua Eaton. So congratulations to Kevin. And last but certainly not least, someone who's retiring very shortly. Very shortly. Very shortly. <laughs> this week, right? Next week. Next week. Um, Darlene Porter has been here for over 30 years, right? 30 30.9 <laughs> years. Um, and I would have to say, I've known Darlene because I've been here close to 30.9. Um, I've known Darlene for a long, long time, and she really has been the glue that has kept the facilities department together for, for all these years and has done a tremendous job. So, Darlene, thank you for your years of service. <laughs> And I'm just going to keep going. All right. <laughs> so we have some uh, some district awards as well. Um, 
our technician who is has been at multiple schools and currently right now I believe is at Wood End in Killam. Uh, Karen Sawyer, 10 years of service. Someone who has been here for 20 years um, and has also been the glue that has probably kept Central Office together, <laughs> Linda Engelson. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, someone who actually I hired in 1997 and has um, been here now for 20 years. <laughs> Assistant Superintendent Craig Martin. There's two other things I'd like okay. to say. Um, so a few, uh, several years ago, and some of you may remember, um, we had a philanthropist in town, Arnold Berger. Arnold Berger started um, a uh, fund through the town of Reading to uh, award teachers uh, recognition. And so all of the awards this evening that you see are funded from the uh, perpetual award uh, grant that we receive every year from the Berger Foundation. So we really appreciate the support that Arnold Berger's foundation has given us over the years to provide the, the pins and the, and the apples um, that you see here this evening. The other thing is um, none of this would have been possible without the work of our um, Human Resources Administrator, Jen Bobby. So Jen, thank you very much. May I talk again? Yes, you may. Very rare, relatively, probably every decade that a member of the school committee gets to stand up and do this. Um, but we have one more honoree this evening. <coughs> Celebrating his 30 years of service to the Reading Public Schools is our superintendent. I'd like to present you with your 30 year pin. Thank you. And a plaque that says uh, 30 year service award presented to Dr. John Doherty in appreciation for your 30 years of dedicated service to the students of Reading. I would like to tell you this comes with a trip to Disney. Uh, <laughs> it does not. <laughs> but it comes from with a quote from Walt Disney, who I know is a, is a favorite. Yep. Uh, it is, we keep moving forward, opening new doors, and doing new things because we're curious. And curiosity keeps leading us down new paths. So thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you. two different guys who are now raising families of their own. Um, they remembered his energy, his good energy, and one of them remembered that he used to play football behind Coolidge after school with them sometimes. And the reason I'm sharing those two stories with you is what your kids are gonna remember, for those of you who are retiring and those of you who are just starting out, what your students are gonna remember is your relationship with them. And I know from experience as a parent in this community that the relationships, the teachers, and this this community build with their students are so powerful and so beautiful. And that's what they're gonna carry with them is how much you love them and how much you support them and how much you believe in them. Um, so I just wanna share that with you that we all are so very, very grateful for the work that you do every day. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.
going to be an exciting meeting. You're definitely not going to stick around. But in case you don't, we'll take a five minute break. <laughs>
we are doing look goals. Um, <clears throat> we usually start with our student reports, and we are going to miss Alex, our senior who graduated yesterday, um, but she is being succeeded by Mario, who I feel like I just met as a junior, and you're now our senior rep, um, and I understand that Caitlin Commodoris is going to be our representative from the junior class. Oh. So thank you and welcome, Caitlin. <laughs> I don't know if you'd like to tell us a little about yourself. Sure, so uh, my name is Caitlin, I go by Katie Doe Commodoris. Um, I'm a current sophomore at Reading Memorial High School. Um, I'm very excited to serve as a student rep on the school committee. Um, so I started my journey in the Reading school systems at Kellen Elementary School. And then I went to um, Coolidge Middle School and now here at RMHS. Um, in school, I'm a member of the Interact Club as well as the, with the Girl Rising Initiative. Um, very rewarding work, I love it. Um, outside of school, I'm on a competitive dance team um, and also teach both dance and religious education. Um, additionally, I volunteer at different events around town. Um, and I uh, enjoy spending quality time with my family and friends a lot. Um, my current interests and studies revolve around math and science, um, and I will be focusing on those subjects next year in my junior year at RMHS. Um, and very interested, in, very interested in town politics. Um, I love being involved with politics and everything, so I'm very excited to have this position. Thank you. Well, that is wonderful. Welcome. Great. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. things are really winding down at the high school. I don't know if you two have a report this evening. I have a few things. Oh, great. Uh, so um, I know today and tomorrow the, uh, the freshmen are, having, are doing the STEM MCAS. Um, there's a uh, financial fair uh, for the juniors this Thursday. I think it's the first three blocks of the day. Um, and that was like, uh, I, know, I know in my math class we did the, uh, the HR block budget challenge. I think it's something similar to that, um, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, the, the underclassmen awards are next Monday uh, in the morning uh, in the field house. Uh, we have freshman fly up today, uh, freshman fly up, fly up day uh, today, and the uh, future freshman night is going to be next Wednesday. Thank you so Thanks much. Yep. Info. And Thanks. welcome again, Caitlin. Thank you. Um, liaison reports from the committee. Anything? Yeah, Dr. Mm -hmm. Doxer. A couple of things. The Human Relations Advisory Committee will be meeting um, this Thursday instead of last Thursday, so June 8th at 7 at the police station. Um, we moved it because there was a wonderful baccalaureate service, which I'm sure will be discussed, right? I'll be more than happy to, yes. <laughs> um, and we didn't want to compete with a wonderful interfaith opportunity, and um, we were not disappointed. It was a wonderful service. So we will be meeting this week at the police station at 7 this Thursday. Um, and um, the, there will also be, um, at the last Board of Selectmen meeting, there was a discussion about the Clergy Association working with Rabbi Abramson from, I believe it's Burlington, Burlington. on a townwide event. Um, and we'll hopefully get an update on that status um, on Thursday. And um, we'll also be talking about our restructuring and um, our Friends and Family Day. I hope everybody comes in June. I believe it's the 17th. It is the 17th. Um, and that, I think, captures the Human Relations Advisory Committee. I wanted to say that I had a wonderful experience at Parker at the writing day. Um, I got to hear almost all of Tara Sullivan's presentation and it was incredibly inspiring and doable. She brought, um, she brought to the kids a way to really pursue something they cared about in writing and um, I just looked around me, everybody was mesmerized, and I looked and felt what a gift that was, not only to our students, but to our world. Um, so really kudos to her and kudos to Robin Ferenzani, who had organized that incredibly complicated day. If you could see this um, schedule with different people, different volunteers. Again, I'll, rel I'll let Dr. Darty report more on that, but um, the kids that I had in my workshop which was writing for a purpose, um, was 
they, they were each inspiring, so attentive and thoughtful and creative. It was great. Um, I also um, had the privilege to attend class day, and so I've been attending these for a long time since my oldest had attended, and I was really impressed by the technological skills of those kids that present, those students that present, created the slideshow, um, but also how the messages have evolved. I think that they're getting better, um, the messages. Um, and um, there's no report to the CPAC tonight that I know of unless, um, and, um, I just wanted to also mention something that I was really excited about that was mentioned in this week's journey. Um, I've been a part of the efforts around character development and core values in the schools for a long time. And I was really excited that the teachers are looking for ways to capture progress with the core values. Um, so they're not only just giving out um, the kudos and the awards, they're also looking to figure out what that tells them about the culture of the school and how they might be able to capture the difference to, to make it better or um, to have a sense of what's happening with the programs that they're in, implementing. And I really was impressed and thrilled to read that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from the committee? I have two quick items. The school committee will be at Friends and Family Day on June 17th, so mark your calendars and um, you know, be thinking about donating an hour or two of your time if you can. And um, we are knee deep in evaluations, um, the evaluation process for Dr. Doherty. Um, thank you to all of you for getting me your draft evaluations, almost all at the deadline, super close anyway. Um, but I will need your final evaluations by Thursday because I'm beginning over the weekend to um, combine them and to begin the final evaluation process. So if you have a draft that you've sent me and you plan to make changes to it, if you could have me your final, final version by Thursday, I would really appreciate that. Um, and we will be discussing that and finishing that process at our next meeting. Um, Dr. Doherty, anything from your side of the table? I'll first say, did you have any? Yeah, um, real quickly, I'll echo what um, Dr. Doxer said about the Parker event. I also had the privilege of attending. It was a wonderful event. Having been a middle school teacher myself for many years, it was great fun to get to teach a lesson. I told the kids I was with my people again. And so they were, they were awesome. The kids were awesome. Um, but I also wanted to um, say something about the Eaton event. As you know, at the end of the year, there's so many different culminating events happening in the schools. But I thought, especially with some of the Eaton staff here, I wanted to commend them. I had the privilege of attending their author celebration day on Friday, and it was amazing. We had, what, 60, 70 volunteers as well. Um, all the kids in the school sharing their writing and just the way the kids were outstanding, the way everything was run. We had to pay a little extra, we said, for the beautiful weather that day to come outside, but it was worth it because it really was an amazing day. So kudos to them on arranging all of that. It was really helpful. Thank you. Um, just a brief update from my office. Um, it's a busy time of the year trying to wrap everything up and plan for the next year. We do have two vacant team chair positions, one here at Reading Memorial High School um, and one at Birch Meadow and Wood End. That's where Kelly Bostwick is leaving to go to the Rise Preschool. We have done interviews and moved some names forward, so we're hoping by the next time we meet I can announce those um, positions. We have some movement in special education teacher positions, some Teachers have resigned, um, taken on other opportunities, so we'll have more updates on that as we kind of go through that process. We are interviewing for the 0.5 BCBA position that we had put in the budget through restructuring of funds. Uh, we have most of our extended school year hiring has been complete. Kelly Decato and Karen Rando are co-coordinating the extended school year program and um, have really done a nice job kind of putting that together, which is a lot of work. Um, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about our English language learner population. We don't talk about that a lot. Um, this year we, through SEAM Collaborative, uh, were able to access Title III funding, some grant funding. So with that funding, we're able to provide some professional development for our staff over the summer that this grant will support. We also are able to purchase some resources for our students and families who are English language learners. So we've purchased some series of books 
that we'll be providing to the students at the end, end of the year celebration that will be taking place at the Reading Public Library, which will be a great opportunity for students to connect with the library and oh, also receive some books that they can read over the summer. Our staff who work in the ELL department will also be writing to our students to help engage them in writing and um, writing letters about what they're reading. Additionally, we receive some funding through this grant to provide a small amount of summer tutoring again for our ELL students. So we're excited to provide these opportunities and um, I want to thank Carla Panacchio for her work in putting this all together so we have these resources available for both our staff and our families in the community. Okay. Um, I have several items, so this may take a few minutes. It's a busy time of year. It is a busy time of year. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce for the first time to the school committee Lisa Maria Polito. I think she's behind me somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa Marie will be assuming the role of Josh Wheaton principal on July 1st. Uh, she's currently the STEM coordinator for the Wilmington Public Schools. Um, I know for a fact, because I've seen her there, she's been at Joshua Eaton at least 10 times uh, <laughs> since she's been appointed and probably more. Uh, she's been very active in the night events, uh, such as the ice cream social. I believe she was scooping ice cream, rumor has it. Uh, but I know she's also been meeting with teachers, um, been meeting with the school council um, and, and other groups. So um, she's getting a good understanding of Joshua Eaton and will be able to hit the ground running uh, on July 1st. So I just wanted to introduce you to Lisa and she's here this evening also to be to listen to the Josh Eaton presentation. Um, I also I'm going to briefly talk about a couple of the events that we've already been mentioned um, and a lot all of these were um, mentioned also in the newsletter this week which I highly recommend that the community um, looks at. It, we, we try very hard to keep the community updated of all the different events that are going on um, in our public schools, especially things that are connected to the curriculum. And in this week, uh, there is the Parker Writing Celebration actually has the front page, but we also talk about some of the things that are going on with MTSS, and there are several pictures in there of different events that have been happening, um, uh, including the baccalaureate, which is something that I wanted to discuss. Um, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Doxa brought up the baccalaureate. So, uh, the baccalaureate originally was going to be at the First Congregational Church. That was the same night as the fire uh, downtown. So uh, thanks to the facilities department, and um, we were able to move some things around and have it at Joshua Eaton, uh, which was, and I, I really want to thank the facilities department for all of their hard work behind the scenes. It wasn't just moving the event. It was also moving the ice cream. And which is a very important part of this, uh, of this interfaith celebration. So we had to make sure that we had uh, freezer storage at Parker Middle School because Eaton's freezer storage was, was, was not big enough to hold all the ice cream. So we, our custodians had to move the ice cream from Parker to Eaton and make sure it was there right at the right time so it didn't melt. So I, I do uh, give kudos to the, to the facilities department for all of their hard work and setting up the gym for the baccalaureate celebration, and then the ice cream social, which was in the cafeteria. But it was a beautiful event. We probably had close to 200 people that were there, including the Reading Clergy Association, who sponsors the event. Uh, myself and Mr. McSweeney gave some remarks, um, as well as we had several students from the different uh, faiths talk about what faith means to them from their perspective. We also had a beautiful music a uh, violin piece that was done from one of our students, um, Tim Sanford, uh, who did a great job as well. So um, all in all, it's, I, I, the way I describe it is it is the last learning experience of our high school seniors before graduation. Um, and it, it really is a, it's a, it's a very powerful evening. Um, so I want to thank the Clergy Association for, uh, for putting that on every year. I also want to thank Kristen Killian and the, um, the chorus um, who also sing at the event. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about graduation. Um, and I know all of you were there yesterday as well. I want to thank Mr. Barker for all of his work uh, in making that possible and his staff. Um, there's a obviously a lot of planning that goes into uh, graduation. And we had 358 students graduate. It was one of the largest classes uh, in Reading Memorial High School history. As I mentioned yesterday, it was the 150th um, class ever to graduate in a Reading High School, the 60th on this campus, 
and the tenth in our new renovated building. Um, and so um, it was a it was a pretty special day, pretty special milestone day for for our for our students. And um, the students did a great job. The valedictorian, the salutatorian, the class president uh, uh, did a great job with the speeches. And um, also, it was 92 minutes, which uh, was uh, which was a record, <laughs> which I know Phil over there likes. <laughs> Everybody's dinner reservation was four o'clock. It was. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're all sitting around waiting. <laughs> and congratulations to to Mr. Robinson, who had uh, a son graduate yesterday yeah. as well. Yeah, congratulations. Excellent. Um, a couple of other things. Um, I, I want to talk about, uh, and while while we are in this in this room here, I do want to I do want to announce um, that we are going to have a partnership next year in this room with RCTV. Um, we've been meeting with Mr. Rushworth and his staff uh, for the last couple of months. Um, the goal is to have a satellite TV studio right behind you in these two rooms here, um, and we're also going to have a staff member. Uh, teaching our uh, some TV production uh, digital uh, digital courses as well during the school day for our uh, high school students uh, this is all going to be part of uh, RCTV's contribution uh, uh, to the uh, to the program so we want to thank RCTV and we look forward to the partnership it's been a long time coming for RCTV to come back um, they used to be here before the high school was renovated if you remember and um, now they're going to be coming back. So we look forward to having them back in the fall next year. Excellent. And then uh, the only other piece that I want to bring up um, is I want to talk a little bit about the school transformation grant, because uh, I know there's been some discussion about that in the public. Um, so the school transformation grant, as you know, it's a five-year grant that we received. Um, we are in the, we are completing our third year of the grant, it, approximately $250,000 a year uh, for that grant. Um, all of the information that I am receiving from Washington, D.C. is that grant will continue and will continue to be funded for the last two years. In the, uh, the Department of Education FY18 budget proposal, it is in there as a continuation grant. Um, the feeling is with these grants that once they begin the funding, they don't want to stop the funding of the, of the cycle that's, that's in place. Um, so the good news is, is that funding will uh, continue for the next two years. Um, the, the not so good news is, as you know, um, Sarah Bird, who has been our administrator for social emotional learning for, I think, eight years, um, is going to be leaving on June 30th, and she's going to be going to um, uh, her hometown for a, a higher level administrative position with, with a similar theme of social emotional learning. And so we certainly um, want to thank uh, Ms. Bird for all of her hard work in uh, what she has done for the Reading Public Schools over the, over the last um, several years. Uh, I've worked very closely with her, and I know other staff members here have worked very closely with her in really putting the structures in place um, so that we can continue to move forward. And I, I believe that she's leaving it in a, in a good place um, for, for the next person to, to, to take it and, and run. What our plan is, um, is we're going to change the scope of the position a little bit. As you know, um, Sarah was not only um, an administrative position, but she was also the grants coordinator. So what we're going to be doing, because which is partially funded, the salary is partially funded in the operating budget and partially funded out of the um, school transformation grant. So we are, we're, we're going to be changing the scope of the position a little bit. It's going to be more of a... Uh, social emotional learning behavioral health coach position. Um, the advantage to this is it's going to provide our teachers with more direct coaching support. Um, Sarah did provide some of that support, but not um, was not able to do as much because of her, because of her grant responsibilities. She's also this, this position is also going to be overseeing, which Sarah currently uh, is the therapeutic support program and supporting um, Carolyn Wilson in that in that area, um, as well as working with school psychologists K to uh, K to 12, and social workers. So it is it is a very important role for our district as we continue uh, to keep the focus on behavioral health. Um, 
It may look a little bit different also because we're going to have to shift grant responsibilities to other staff members. So we're in the process of restructuring that right now. Um, so I just wanted to update the committee on that. And as soon as we have more information, we'll, we'll report it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I believe that's it. Can I ask a question on the RCTV? Yes. Um, what, if any, budget impact for FYE team will that there, there are no budget impact for the Reading Public Schools. This is being funded um, through our RCTV. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yes, go so ahead. what about the room downstairs? That's coming up here too, or? Oh, uh, next to the school committee room? Yeah. No, no, that's still going to remain a, um, this is going to be a, a TV studio, actually, where kids are going to be able to take classes in here um, and be able to do editing and um, uh, digital, uh, digital work, literacy work. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. Oh, sorry. Um, can I just clarify on this, the school transformation? So yes. um, the way you're restructuring it, though, it would basically have the Positions would still, the total number of positions are still the same, but you're just restructuring. So, um, correct. Whereas before Sarah was partly the grant, basically someone else is going to end up with some grant pieces, and the person who's replacing Sarah is going to be doing the coaching and the therapeutic support. Correct. Okay, I just want to. Try to stick yeah, Dr. Fox. I, I just wanted to say, I'm, I think I'm recognizing some real listening. And, and attempts to adhere to the challenge that we were given um, in terms of the cogent path forward and trying to be creative in how we achieve the same purposes and fund our curriculum and our priorities um, going forward. And so I really appreciate that. I'm eager to learn. I know how stretched our administration is, so I'm eager to learn how the grant responsibilities will be divvied up because I already see people, administrators here, seven days a week into the night. Um, and so I just hope that um, I don't want people to burn out. So I just want to watch that. Um, but I do really appreciate how seriously you take our challenge right now to stretch our funding and not compromise our priorities. Thank you. Dr. So, Dr. Doherty, so that position that you've restructured, is that going to be partially grant funded or is that strictly? No, it's going to be partially grant funded. So we're going to, it, the funding isn't going to change. When it's not going to result in savings. Um, we're going to be shifting the grant funding and the um, operating budget funding differently with the positions that are currently involved. Okay. That's our plan right now. I mean, yeah. obviously, we have to find the right person for the position, and that's going to determine some of this as well. Okay. Anything else? No. Okay. I think that's it. Um, I just realized, I apologize to the committee, I skipped right over the school committee reorganization, which I think means I want to keep like a vice like grip <laughs> on the gavel. Um, so I'm going to propose, since we have staff here to present, just to keep moving. I think doing the Joshua Eden update makes sense. And then we can do the reorganization with the liaison assignments all together. Sure. That's kind of more housekeeping. Um, so unless there's an objection. All right, I'm very excited to hear this presentation. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, tonight, it's, we're very excited to welcome you to the team. <clears throat> um, so, thank you for for having me here this evening. I'm certainly here with some some mixed emotions. Uh, it's difficult to to present um, by a lot of time, but I'm always excited to talk about the work that's happening in our school um, and the amount of time and effort and energy that the staff and the community have put in to to make sure that we continue to move forward. And we're going to talk a lot about what's happened over the course of this year. Uh, the last time I was here back in February, so I'll give you an update on what things have looked like since then. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what that projection looks like going forward, obviously, with Lisa taking the helm. Um, as often, sorry, we're going to be closer. There you go. Um, as, as often happens with any type of work that's happening in our schools, it's a real community effort. Uh, so I'm going to have our member of our school council, um, so Christine Lusk, who's been the co-chair of the council with me this past year, has really 
uh, been a great support to me, been a great support to the school, and has helped spearhead a lot of the work that's happened at Joshua Eaton. Uh, so I'm going to allow her to share a few words first, and then I'll get into the presentation from my end. Thank you so much for having us here this evening. And I do want to thank you so much for letting us have Eric for the last two years. I know last uh, February I personally pled to Dr. Doherty if we could please keep Eric. So thank you so much. We've really enjoyed having him for the last two years. And I'm really going to enjoy, miss working with you. Um, and the last time I presented to you was in this fall when we had recently received our test scores. and. We were not very excited about them, but we were optimistic about the year ahead. And we really have had a wonderful year at Joshua Eaton. Um, I really do want to thank Eric as well as all of the staff at Joshua Eaton because they really took the time to kind of get at some of the root causes, um, which have, we've, the whole community has really been frustrated with. Um, and not only did they identify some of the underlying challenges, um, they all kind of dug in and did a mid-year curriculum change. And I just really want to acknowledge how much work that was for all of the staff at the school to really halfway through the year say, OK, let's change the way we're doing this. Um, and they did it wonderfully. And I think Principal Sprung will talk about the results of it. Um, and I also want to thank the school committee, because I know there was some funding from you um, to build up our wonderful library of books that the children are now coming home and reading. Um, and I'm sure over the next couple of years, we'll really see the results of all that hard work. Um, but as I told you in the fall, there are a lot more things that make Joshua Eaton a wonderful community and a wonderful place to be. And I kind of want to show you. Let's see if I can. I'm standing right in front of this. No, I think we can move okay. this down here. Now you're seeing all of his slides, so don't. Worry. <laughs> um, okay, no pictures. <laughs> um, well, as um, Mr. Martin mentioned, we just had our author, Junior Author Fest, on Friday, and that's a wonderful event. This is our fourth year doing it, and not only were there over 70 parents that volunteered that day. It's a year-long effort, and it's a true collaboration between the staff and parents who come in all throughout the year to make books. So the children write their books, and the teachers really put a lot of effort into having each child write a few books that they are so proud of sharing. And then these are laminated and made into actual books. And so at the Junior Author Fest, we have a parent leading a group of children, grades kindergarten through fifth grade, and they're each presenting their books showing the pictures, and all of the children kind of chime in and mention what they love about the book, and they ask pictures, and it just leaves every child feeling so proud of what they've accomplished, and it's just such a wonderful experience. I do encourage you all to come next year. It's every June. Um, so that was a wonderful event. Uh, we also had our second spelling bee this year, and it is a, such a fun event. Uh, Miss Quinn has put in so much time uh, co-chairing the Spelling Bee. And it's another event that's just been a wonderful collaboration. Oh, we're skipping around. Um, here's some pictures from the Spelling Bee. Um, between parents and teachers, um, and of course the principal. Um, so the way we do the Spelling Bee, it's a team format. So it's just great to see the children work together, and of course some really go at it like, who are the best spellers? I'm going to win. <laughs> and some students saying, who are my friends? Like, who would be a great team? Um, and it's just a great night. I think everybody walks away just feeling really proud that they were up there taking a part of this, as you can see the happy faces. Um, and of course, the winners get to have lunch with the principal, which, which is always fun. Um, and then we also do an art contest related to the spelling bee. And the winner of the art contest, they get their artwork on any material that's related to the spell spelling bee and the spellathon. So not only do we try and get their artwork on the front page of the Chronicle, but for the next year, if there's some, a flyer coming home or the program for the spelling bee, their artwork is on there. Um, and anybody's welcome to do it. Um, 
but it's really cute to see how excited they are and proud they are of their wonderful imaginations. Here we have our spelling bee, the jaguar jog. Um, we moved the jaguar jog, which is our race, from the fall to the spring this year. We had to postpone it twice due to weather. It was 90 degrees one week, and it was pouring down rain the following. But it's just a wonderful event. And I especially love this last picture of two girls just kind of holding their hands, pulling each other towards the finish line. Um, we see all levels of competition, but everybody should be really proud of this event. It's another great event where there's staff out there, the nurses out there, the administrators are out there, their parents out there, um, and it's just a great school spirit feeling of achievement. Here's a junior author fest so you can see all the teams down on the grass um, reading their books and the children each proud of their books. Um, so, oh, and then this Friday night is our variety show. Um, so if anybody's available Friday night looking for some entertainment, it's 6.30 at Parker Auditorium. Um, but it really has been a wonderful year at Joshua Eaton. And we really want to thank, thank Principal Sprung. And we're so excited to have Lisa Marie joining us next year. Um, she's been very present so far, so um, she has some tough you know, shoes to fill, but <laughs> we're very excited to have her. Thank you so much. Thanks for staying. Um, so when, when we started off the year, as many of you know, we, we had two goals that we aligned with our district improvement plan. Um, and so we talked about the academic needs for our student population. And then we also talked about communication. So I'm going to share some of the information that has come from data that we've collected in these areas, along with some other information uh, that is going to help our school continue to move forward. So I'm going to start with some literacy data. Um, in the winter of this year, we identified one of the challenges that we had faced was the data that came um, prior to this school year we were using some resources and materials where scores didn't necessarily accurately reflect what the students' reading levels were and the skills that the students had. So we made a shift in January. We reassessed all of the students, uh, and then we implemented the new curriculum. We spent a lot of time doing training. Um, our K-3 to teachers really made a big shift in terms of their practices, and then we have recently done assessments. So this is the result of the assessments looking from January to now. Um, ideally, certainly over a course of the year, you'd want students to move up several levels, but really since January, we kind of looked at how, what percentage of our pop population moved up at two, at least two guided reading levels um, since the assessment back in January. And so I'll just share 95% of our students in kindergarten, 97% in first grade, 89% of our second graders, and 96% of our third graders made that leap that we had hoped for. Um, in terms of moving up reading levels. And, and in some cases, the reason some kids may have not moved up to reading levels is because they started at such a high level. Um, the, the shift from one level to the next didn't necessarily, it would have been um, a bit more of a challenge because you're already starting at a high level. Some students didn't necessarily make that growth. Um, so they moved up at least to reading levels. Um, the other thing that happens is we have a new program that we're using. It's a structured reading program. Um, the, that we use for students that were significantly below grade level, so the LLI program, um, where kids get individualized tutoring based on, because they're the lowest percentage in terms of the skills that they had when it came to their reading. So they get individualized work with our tutors using this program that's daily for um, every day for 30 minutes. Um, and we wanted to see that those students were going to be making growth because since they've been in our school for a number of years, they hadn't made the growth that we wanted to see. So um, we were proud to see that all nine of those students that are getting this individualized tu tutoring were making progress and in some cases moved up several levels um, to, to have significant growth. Um, so um, the, the last slide, um, 
we had 40% of our students actually moved up more than two. So I reported out um, in these first notes how many have moved up at least two, but 40% of that group moved up more than two. So many students moved up three, four, even five levels um, since January. So I would say we had some success when it came to those shift in reading practices for grades K through three. Um, and here you can see some of the students doing that work. Um, there's a lot of partner work when it came to reading, individualized reading, um, and they take a lot more notes um, when they're reading, so they're really reflecting on their reading practices. So when you see kids with sticky notes, um, they're actually responding to the text and really thinking about what they're reading, which has been a big shift in the reading practices that we've had at Joshua Eaton. Um, so I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the assessing math concepts. Um, assessment that we use. So this is our kindergarten um, assessment using the Assessing Math Concepts Program. This is new for us this year. Uh, so at this stage, we haven't had a really a comparison across schools or across from, from the beginning of the year till now. But you can see it, at this stage um, how many of our kindergarten students have, made, have met certain standards um, using the using the green is where they're at or above. Um, so there's counting, making piles, sequences, um, in terms of using counters and without counters. So you can see what that looks like. At some point, um, we'll take a look at how this compares across schools. But right now, this is the first time we've actually done this type of assessment with the students. So it helps us identify where the kids' areas of struggles are and what the interventions are that are gonna be necessary for this group of students. Um, and the same, for first grade, they really focused on this one specific area, which is changing numbers. So with 73 students ascend, assessed, 60% of them were at or above, but now we've identified that we have to work with the other 40% on that particular skill. Um, and the Assessing Math Concepts program has specific interventions for students um, in, in that particular area. Um, so uh, just a little bit about communication, because the other goal that we were working on was related to communication. We sent out a survey this year. We worked with the school council, um, and we identified how the school community is feeling about our communication out to them in terms of the work that's happening in the building, um, how, how the parent community interacts with us. Are they getting all the information that they need, and are, what are the areas that we need to continue to improve? So we had a very high satisfaction rating from the parent community in terms of our weekly newsletter. So we made a pretty significant shift in our weekly newsletter this year where we actually had parents um, help author this newsletter and they helped create what they thought the parent community would really appreciate. So we provided the content from the school and then we had some really wonderful parents who were graphic designers um, help do this publication and so it really had a positive impact on our school community and we had great satisfaction for parents who re read the newsletter and gain a lot of information from those newsletters. And then 70% of the community also uses teacher newsletters to gain information. And then you can see um, the number of parents that are satisfied with our communication from the classrooms as well as our school-wide communication policy that we created. And we realized we need to do a little bit more work in terms of communicating out our policy and then making sure that we're implementing the policy, trying to get um, up to cl closer to a 90 to 100% of parents who are satisfied with the amount of communication from the classroom. We found that in the primary grades, the parents are very satisfied with that communication and we're just trying to con continue to make sure that weekly communication happens from the upper grades and that was where the, um, the lower percentages fell in terms of communication. Um, Asking about, um, asking for comments from parents, you can see some of the comments they made about our communication that comes from our weekly newsletter. Um, this is just what a sample of our newsletter looks like on the left, our Jaguar tracks. As you can see, um, it's got a lot of color, a lot of vibrancy. It has interactive links that send parents directly to our website, which is where we try to house all of our information. Um, calendar updates, making sure those are available, and then we also house the newsletter on our website so parents can access it at any time. 
Um, and then we have a Facebook page, which we update regularly. So that's done by staff. Um, so the staff makes every effort to take pictures of the events that are happening in the school, and then they post um, positive information about the school on our school Facebook page, uh, which has been very positive. We get a lot of likes um, in terms of the work that's been happening at Joshua Eaton. Um, we talked a little bit about MTSS data tonight, and I'll share with you some of the things that we've done. So our MTSS team um, tries to find as many ways as we can to provide positive reinforcement to the students, and then we want to know, are we doing well as a staff, and are we able to reinforce that, and are students getting the kind of reinforcement that we want on a daily, da daily basis, and what does that look like in terms of how it impacts students coming to the office? So. Um, we had a very high effectiveness rating in terms of our supports that we're providing for students, um, in terms of having meetings, um, promoting our core values through assemblies, creating routines that are part of our school environment, um, and we have done a, a, an excellent job. You want to make sure you're at least 70% in terms of your um, fidelity, in terms of implementing the program, and we've been above 70% for the last year. Um, we do a lot of core value recognition, so we have little cards um, that we have for all the students, and students, um, we put hole punches in the cards anytime we see a student rec being spotted for their core values, and if they get their card punched 10 times, we post all the cards up on the wall, and I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Um, and we had over 900 cards that were completed this year. So we have 400 students, that means on average most kids get at least twice over the course of the year, they'll have their card hole punched um, at least 20 times. So that's really positively reflecting on students. Our teachers are in a habit of reinforcing positive behaviors for students, which has a great impact on their success. And 100% of the staff um, are using this recognition, recognition system, and then 100% of our students also get individualized um, special spots is what we call them because they are actually read out loud um, in our morning announcements. So we have a few um, that when students are really doing something unique and something special, we want their, them to hear their name on the morning announcement. So every single student at Josh Wheaton gets their name read on the morning announcements for doing something special and spectacular over the course of the year. Um, we have our monthly assemblies highlighting our school values and recognizing students and because of all the positive reinforcement, we have less students um, that come to the office and certainly less students that have to be repeat offenders coming to the office. So um, we've had 4% of students have more than one office discipline referral. So even if a student does have to come to the office, very rarely is there a repeat offender. Often um, they come to the office, we have a conversation, we do some appropriate level of discipline consequences for whatever the, the challenges are that they faced. And then when they get back into the classroom, um, we continue to make sure we use those positive reinforcements so they don't end up coming back to the office. And it, it's fortunate that it happens rarely. Um, so, as you can see, there's some pictures of our assemblies, um, the hallway expectations you see, and we have posters around the uh, building for hallway expectations, classroom expectations, um, and the bathroom and cafeteria, all of those um, that we like to share. There's the board with all our cards, um, where ki after kids get their cards punched 10 times, they're displayed in the main hallway, and any time we have an assembly, we do a reinforcement system. Uh, where kids are sh showing how they're going to work towards success or whatever our core value is that we spotted um, and highlighting for that month. Uh, another piece of data that we wanted to look at was music. So we had an interesting shift this year. So we used to have a winter concert um, that students would come. They'd sing three songs that were holiday songs. Um, and then they would come off the stage and they would do this by grade level. So you'd have a quick three songs by kindergarten, they'd get off the stage, first grade would come up, and so on and so forth. We decided to shift that practice this year where we wanted to highlight actual instruction that's happening with our music program. The music teachers felt that the winter concert gave a quick snapshot but didn't really highlight all the strengths of our music program. So we have shifted to something we call informances. And after we did these informances, we took um, 
a survey of parents how they felt this looked. So an informant is parents having the opportunity to go into a music class, watch their kids during music, watch the teacher teaching during music. You get a real flavor for what music instruction in the school really looks like. Um, so as we shifted to this informant, we had a 90% favorability rating from the parents, even though I think some of them really wanted the kids dressing up and doing the show, um, asking parents how they felt about the informances. They got really excited because they got to see their kids in class with the teacher and, and really live that experience. So we had the great favorability rating um, and 83% of the families encouraged us to do it again this upcoming school year. Um, so the additional comments you can see there, they felt really positive that I would say probably many parents really liked it. Some parents, if you asked, they would want both. Uh, they really liked the concert idea, but they also liked going into class and seeing what it looked like. Um, and you can see some of the informances that were taking place with the kids. Um, so just in general, some things that have been happening since I was last here. Uh, we had a training, um, Alan Bloom, who comes um, from Landmark and does training with our special education teachers. Um, this time he did special education teachers and regular education teachers together to talk about what our instruction should look like supporting students um, with different learning needs. So that was something that we did um, this past year. We, we um, since February, and we also used a staff meeting, uh, Carolyn Wilson, our team chairperson and one of our special education teachers, um, did a training on accommodations and how teachers should be implementing accommodations in the classroom, um, using our eSped program and then partnering with special education and regular education teachers together. We've done MTSS training. Um, we had a library focus group. Um, where we actually talked about ways that our library program can help support all the literacy changes and what ways can we create a love of the library program that will match what our literacy changes should be. Um, we finished the MCAS program. The WASH committee has taken a focus on mindfulness um, and actually brought in a guest speaker, Dr. Christopher Willard, um, who was here um, about a month ago. Uh, and that was very positively received by the community. I think they had over 100 people that attended that training. Um, I'm sorry, that presentation. Um, we offered a coffee with the special, with the special education PAC, um, with myself and, and the special education director were there. Um, continuing to look at our scheduling, making sure IEPs are gonna be taken into account, looking at our overall structures, um, making sure interventions and instructional needs are gonna be in place for next year. Uh, we've done K-3 to training from the Teachers Learning Alliance on the literacy changes because we told the staff not only are you doing, the, not only are you getting trained as, training as you shifted in January, but we want to continue that training. So the Teaching Learning Alliance came, did a follow-up training on our Lucy Calkins reading program um, with Trish Stodden, and that was something that was very powerful for them. Uh, we talked about how Lisa Murray has come and has been a great addition and has been meeting with staff and the community. Um, and then we spent money on the books and we've talked about um, our open house uh, where parents come and visit the school and the Jaguar jog that has happened as well. So if I were to kind of sum up where we are, I would say we had some really great successes in terms of our literacy shift um, in grades K to three. I think the LLI program, which provides the interventions has been positive. Our communication um, with school newsletter and many staff has been positive. We have the library focus group that's shifting our library program to make sure it's supporting our literacy initiative. Um, we're doing continued collaboration for special education and regular education together. I'll let um, Carolyn's gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Um, we had the music informances, and then we found a variety of methods of communication, including our, our positive Facebook page. So we, but we still have to, a lot to do, um, and this is where uh, Lisa's gonna jump right in and, and continue the great work that's happening around literacy, making sure that that continues, um, making sure we're using accurate benchmark data to monitor the effective progress of students. We monitor students three times a year, and now that we have accurate data to start with, I think that's gonna be positive for us. Um, making sure we have weekly communication to parents, making sure our library routines continue using the informances and other presentation opportunities um, for parents to see work, um, 
and then the special education program needs to continue to be a collaborative partnership between the special ed class, special ed teachers and classroom teachers, um, and then try to talk about ways we can have more inclusion. I think we're spending a lot of time where students are getting taken out of the classroom, getting some good small group instruction, but I wanna continue to promote the positive work and on the curriculum areas where special education students can be in classrooms getting appropriate accommodations and services, and I'd like to see that continue. Um, so for next year, one of the challenges that we're gonna face because we're now shifting from PARC to MCAS, how are we gonna know how Josh Wheaton is doing? And what are the things that Lisa and the teachers should look for, and what, what are the things the district should look for to know, are we making progress, and are we continuing to move forward? So th this is, what I'm thinking about or what I would be looking for as a principal at Josh Wheaton of what I want to see um, from our school. So I would start a with the benchmark assessment. You want to see how students come in in the fall. You want to see what the January assessment looks like. You want students to continue to make growth. And then at the end of the year, you want to see that they've continued to make a year's worth of progress. And students that are struggling, are they getting LLI intervention programs or what other interventions are happening to make sure students continue to move forward? You, we're going to look at the writing common measures. So that's part of um, all staff in the district use common measures in writing to make sure that when you look at their pre-writing to their post-writing, have they started to implement the Lucy Calkins writing strategies and um, are they making growth in terms of the rubric for Lucy Calkins? The AMC math assessment, you wanna look at Joshua Eaton's AMC math scores in relation to the other schools in the district. Um, because that's gonna give you a, a sense of how we, how we look. It might not be um, necessarily looking at it in comparison to the state, but you wanna know across the district is Josh Wheat measuring up to where we should be. Um, our MTSS work, I would say the data that I showed you today about kids making progress and kids getting recognized, but you also wanna make sure that your office discipline referrals um, stay at a level that's, that's manageable. You wanna make sure that kids are feeling positive and successful. You wanna make sure when you look at kids' connectedness, so what kind of connectedness um, surveys or connectedness opportunities we're providing for kids I think is gonna be important. Um, and then looking at the school improvement plan goals and benchmarks, we create them for that reason. You wanna see, are you making benchmarks? Are you meeting your goals? Are you continuing to make progress in these areas? Um, for MCAS, when I would look at MCAS data, and I actually think this is gonna provide us a pretty good opportunity, because I think one of the things that we've done as a school, and, and I got caught up in this a little bit too, is I was so focused on the number three. Everybody, we were level three, and everything should be focused on this level three number, and why were we level three? And I think it sort of put us in a place where we didn't look at the, the disaggregated data enough. And I think if we end up in a situation where they're not giving us levels, but they're actually gonna give us better data we can look at why are we having individual pockets of students maybe struggling, as opposed to trying to find why are we a level three school? And I think that was something that actually helped me. Um, this year, I took, I, rather than looking at level three, I said, well, why are third grade scores coming in where they are? Let me get to the root causes there, rather than trying to look at the whole entire park test. I actually just focused on the parts of the test where we were really struggling. So I would say, rather than trying to look at the big picture of MCAS, try to find the disaggregated numbers or disaggregated scores that help you identify either standards or groups of students that are struggling and then focus your energy there rather than trying to figure out it, the big reason why Josh Wheaton might be a level three, which is actually just a small segment perhaps of a population. Um, and then obviously looking at our MCAS after school program and how those students perform as well. Um, so upcoming this year, these are the things that we're gonna continue to work on. Um, we're gonna make sure the reading structures and data collection continue to happen. That Lisa and I have talked about that. Um, looking at how we do data meetings, how we're collecting data for ourselves and making sure interventions happen. Um, making sure all the things that, that are in place for communication in the library um, continue to be part of our daily routines and structures, and Lisa and I have had conversations about what that's gonna look like. Um, I'm gonna have Carolyn talk a little bit about special education. She and I have talked about what are the shifts and changes that might be happening going forward. Vacancies 
currently at Josh Wheaton for special education teachers, one in the bridge program, and one is a learning center teacher. And we've talked a lot about how to use those um, vacancies as an opportunity to meet the needs of our students. So um, we've posted one position for the bridge program, and we are in the process of posting the second position to try to attract candidates that we think will meet the needs of the students at Joshua Eaton. And a lot of our work has been about looking at how current IEPs are written, but also the piece that Mr. Sprung um, touched on, which is the idea of inclusion. When we met with the parents, we had a great conversation about how IEPs are written and why it's so important to have inclusion opportunities and to be included in the general education setting. And so we talked a lot about ways we can better educate families about understanding that being in the classroom and receiving the content instruction for their grade level is a priority. And then when can that intervention time happen so that students don't have a gap in their learning and that gap doesn't continue to grow. So that work, we started some of the work with the staff um, at the staff meeting that I was able to attend. I didn't get to meet with all the staff, but we started some of that work. And Alan Bloom also did some of that work when he was there. Um, and I think that is really gonna make a difference. We have done this work in very small groups. We did grade level um, meetings with staff because we wanted an opportunity for people to ask questions, to feel that they could gather the information they need to be effective in their work. So we've done a lot of work. We are not changing, I wanna make it clear, we're not changing the structure of the bridge program. Um, it's still a program for students with language-based learning disabilities and it has the ability to provide a partial inclusion um, setting up to more inclusion opportunities as identified in students' IEPs. We're looking at how we're going to utilize the staff in both the Bridge Program and the Learning Center to meet the needs of all the special education students at Joshua Eaton. So, thank you so much. That was a very helpful presentation. Mrs. Webb. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure if I'm remembering correctly, but when you gave the last update, and we, there was a lot of focus, you had some uh, teachers with you presenting about the math. I think, unless I'm remembering a different elementary school. Um, but I'm, I'm just wondering about the, um, you know, we, we don't have that math uh, coach this coming year, and sort of what kinds of things you've thought about to ensure that um, we can stay on track with the assessments in the classroom and the kind of supports that the classroom teachers are gonna need to make sure we execute on that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit, and perhaps Craig, you wanna jump in about the, the district-wide perspective. So um, the, the K-2 staff was trained on the Assessing Math Concepts program, which helps really narrow down the, the focus of the key standards. Mm -hmm. um, and then they can use that that knowledge base in terms of, and then they have the resource there to provide appropriate interventions. Um, without having a coach, it really there is extra work that falls on the principal, and so you're, as a principal, you're sort of pulled in, in terms of your time because you wanna make sure we continue the literacy work that's right. happening and also train them on math. So it's just a matter of giving teachers opportunity to have those conversations, are having those conversations in data meetings um, where you actually bring the assessing math concepts data and you also have to bring the literacy data to the table so you can say, all right, how does this reflect on our work and what are there small groups of kids that are all struggling in the same area? Can we start to partner kids and partner groups um, so it's not just one teacher in this class working on it, but perhaps um, they're, they're, we can put groups of kids together with Title I staff or tutors or whoever it happens to be. But, mm -hmm. but it really has to be, if a lot of it gets principal-led, um, which certainly is a challenge, but I think in Alaska, it, it's all important. So that, that's what it's important. That's why the day's so long. But just, just to, oh, sure, you can follow. Um, so I guess that, that the challenge there is that if that's how it needs to happen, you've got the teachers for um, a subset of your day um, and obviously you're trying to minimize like uh, class uh, teachers being out of the classroom so right. um, I, I, I appreciate that um, mm -hmm. you know that all of the progress that you've made and the, the work that's ahead of you and ahead of Lisa and the staff is 
um, is, is taking a, a lot of extra um, and a lot of work around the edges that, um, you know, people don't see every day. So yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Mr. Robinson. The, I don't know if you can go back. The slide you had the communication uh, on. I was just curious. So the 92% of the parents, uh, but the 70%, do we men, do the teachers require to do their own newsletter in addition to the weekly, or, or is that optional? Um, so it's, a, it's something that was a collective agreement when I first came to Josh Wheaton that the, we wanted to send a weekly newsletter from the school, and then we also wanted the staff to send weekly communication from the classroom. So what we're finding is that at the beginning of the year, we usually start and are very successful in terms of that work. And then over the course of the year, some of the classroom teachers, um, just from the nature of their day uh, or the nature of their week, sometimes it, it, they're not as consistent as they need to be. So it's just a matter of reminding and reinforcing that we need to make sure that happens weekly. So we're at about 70% of the staff are doing that. We just need to, to remind the other 30% to keep that going over the course of the year because parents certainly appreciate it and find it helpful right, and in terms of reinforcing what needs to happen at and home. We need to get up to 65% parents are satisfied we'd like to see that higher right? yeah yep. thank you mr Bobbin. yeah i just had a question about there's a line at the end about the bridge program because you think it's your second to last right before the thank you slide <clears throat> so just could you give us a little more detail around that? I, i'm interested in just kind of the you, you talked about the changes over the course of the year that you do assessments of all students kind of in the fall again in january and then here we are at the end of the year and we had an update in, in february could could you walk us through the the subset of that i want to use the word assessment but i'm not talking about testing students i'm talking about just getting your arms around the offerings for students with educators staff parents community etc could you walk us through what you found kind of in the beginning in the middle and now at the end of the year with respect to bridge program and any other specific subpopulations that you've been focused on for whatever reason, specifically addressing how your understanding, expectations, plans looked in the fall, how they looked in January, and kind of how they are now, if you could compare those three points in time. Um, are you talking about for individual so, students or the program as a whole? Well, sorry, yeah, the, the program as a whole. So I'm just interested in the subpopulation yep. point that you made that, that we're really um, being in tune with not just, as you put, the, the disaggregated data, the level three, but we really want to understand what's going on for the student experience of students in different parts of our, our community in the school. And so you can start with the bridge program because mm -hmm. you called it out there first, yep. but you know, to kind of walk us through what are the subpopulations you have an eye on and, and how has that perspective changed beginning, middle, end of year? Yeah, so I'll, the, the bridge program, really the, one of the things that we're finding is that we really use IEP data to measure progress. So they, the nice thing about um, IEPs or the, the assessments that we use are they have, to, they have to get reported on three times a year. So what we have found with students' IEPs, um, specifically I'll use the bridge program as the, as the example, is that we're measuring often how they're making progress in individualized programs. So how are they doing on, for, their, for example, like they get an individualized reading program such as Wilson or, or Gillingham or Lips, um, or they get individual benchmarks for certain standards that come up um, within their program. And so we, we find that students actually within those programs can do fairly well. What, we're, what really made us take a shift and why we think we, we need to look at inclusion is because even though those kids are doing well in certain seg in segments of their IP or making progress within the Wilson program, they're not meeting standards that are that are grade level standards. And that's why we feel we need to have a shift in terms of what our instruction looks like for students in those programs or students that are even in the learning center because even though they're making IEP benchmarks, which we're, we're happy about, we're not making the kind of pro progress we'd like to see when it comes to um, grade level standards. So kids are still getting, for, for better terminology, Bs on the report card with the grade level standards, but yet they're, doing, they're having success on their IPs. So that's really how we're measuring that population. We're pleased with the work that's on the IPs, but not, not getting the success that we'd like to in terms of meeting grade level standards. Does that help? No, it, it does. And how that. is that 
has that perspective changed in the way you've staffed, the way you make that transition? Are you going about it the same way you were going about it in September, October timeframe, or have you taken a different approach? Or um, I think it's it's happened in, in the conversations that Carolyn and I have had, and feel free to jump in, but essentially we've made the decision that when we look at students that are part of these programs, how how much time can we get to for these kids to be in the classroom getting access to, to grade level standards. So the, the challenge is you have IEPs that are in place that already have certain segments of the IEP says they have to be out of the classroom. Um, and often parents are pushing for their kids to be out of the classroom because they feel, feel it's more individualized. But we're gonna, tr we, we need to sort of help shift the program where kids can get into the classroom as much as possible. And if they're not in the classroom and they're in a sub-separate setting, are, is the sub-separate setting providing grade level learning opportunities as well? Both of those things really need to happen. Um, and so that's what the shift is gonna be um, going into next year. We wanna make sure that kids have as much access to grade level standards as we can. And I would add to that, there are two kind of tactics. One is our work with the Landmark School who has provided consultation. So that work is to work with both our teachers who are our special educators in the bridge program, but also the classroom teachers who support those students. Because when students are included, we want those language-based methodologies to carry over into that inclusion setting. So we need to ensure that for those students to access the grade level content that Mr. Sprung is talking about, the methodology that our classroom teachers are using is going to make the content accessible. So that's one piece. The other thing we need to do, which Mr. Sprung touched on, is that if students do require that small group setting, we need to help those special educators um, make sure their instruction is in line with the grade level standards. So providing that time for collaboration, ensuring that they understand grade level standards, mm -hmm. not just specialized reading or a specialized writing program, they need to make sure that the standards, the expectations we have for those students are the same as in the grade level. We've done a lot of that work at Parker and we're hoping to continue that work at Joshua Eaton. Um, at Parker, our bridge program, the small group instruction, for instance, the literature that they read mirrors exactly what is being done in grade six, grade seven, grade eight. So those students are exposed to the same content material. They're just taught in a different way using different methodology. So it's kind of a two-pronged approach because we want to be able to have students be included when it is appropriate based on their IEPs. So we need to support those classroom teachers and then we need to support our special educators to make sure that they have knowledge of the grade level content. One of the other things we've done at Parker is some of their, for instance, science teachers might come in during a team time and work with the students who are in the bridge program to reinforce some of the concepts that they're learning. So it's thinking about how we can provide that collaboration as well because both subsets of teachers have expertise to bring to the table. So, thank you. Anything else from the I, I have a question. No. Um, <clears throat> I remember in the fall, and I think, uh, I think Christine mentioned this, that one of the areas for improvement that you identified was that the internal reading assessments for K through three that were being used weren't ad accurately predicting state assessment results. Yep. And so I really appreciate your clarity around that and the work that you've done to specifically address that because I think we're all concerned about grade three ELA scores. The slide you showed has eye-popping, unbelievable results. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how confident are you that that is going to predict an improvement in state, st state assessment scores in the fall? These kids will have just taken the MCAS the last eight weeks. Um, What's your level of confidence that this is going to be reflected in those test scores? So you will see some, while well, we are very pleased with the growth, what you'll find is that what, what we found in January when we gave the scores, that meant that some students actually were performing below grade level. So you have to imagine we had in some, I mean 50% of the population were performing significantly below grade level when we did this new assessment. So we have great growth, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're all now on grade level. You have the growth from January, and so they're taking the 
these third graders are taking their third grade assessment, they, but their, their comprehension skills might still be a little bit below grade level. So you, my, my sense of what this means is that over time, now that this is implemented, the kids will be making the growth that we'd like to see so they're on, getting on to grade level. But right now, while these students have made growth, they're, in a lot of cases, they're still not meeting the grade level standard. We still have some ways to go to get there. That's really um, so that's, that's, that's why I'm encouraging you in the fall to look at growth of students um, and not just look at the, the, the scores as a, as a way of predicting what, what, how successful the scores were. Thank you for that. And I, I don't know if this is a question for you or Mr. Martin, but can we anticipate a student growth percentile beginning in grade four next year the way we have historically, or is that going to change in the fall? From the state, you mean? Yeah. The student, um, My memory is you get it beginning in grade four, right? Yeah, because yes. you need a year's you worth of data. So yet. yeah, um, so I'm assuming the second year the state will do that, but I don't know that for certain. But I'm not. just making that assumption. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to make the point also, well, sort of. I have the floor here. Is that I mean, obviously, I'm saying, stating the obvious, but this is an investment in the future as well. Um, you know, so I really commend all the staff there to really say, let's really take a look at what's happening in K12, where these really fundamental skills taking place to make sure that we're doing the interventions right there and then um, and that's going to pay off clearly yep. in yep. future years when the students are taking assessments in third fourth to fifth grade for the state um, so I think that's great yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, Dr. so does do you have any data from previous years in terms of the literacy data and how it measures up like 95% um, like of students kindergarten up at least two reading levels how's that is there any data from previous years? Um, I don't, not off. I don't have it offhand. I, I could go back and certainly I could you do look at it. Um, the 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 challenging side of it is the data wasn't necessarily accurate data because the assessment wasn't necessarily giving us the right information. Yeah. So, right. Um, but but certainly over the course of a year, you, you I mean, this is students that are making, moving up to grade level since January would be making grade yeah, level for all I and the 40% that you know. are more than two, they're making more, I would say they're on pace for more than years worth of progress. Um, and, and I know, you know and this was apples and oranges in terms of the test, but I was just curious in terms of you know, what type of growth occurred previously. Is this better growth than... Yeah, I, I, I don't have it offhand. Can I just, yeah, just clarify? So, right, so this was a new tool. When did you do the baseline? In January. In January, and yep. then... When this was just recently May. done? Yep, in like, May. In May, so it's okay. Been five months. Okay, so it was a five months. Okay, right. And so when you reported, you reported to us in, was it February? He's come a couple times. I came yeah. in January and February. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. And right. November, too. You were here in the Yeah, and he I'm was here in November. November. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you've, been our, <laughs> you're, you've been our favorite this year, I guess. Uh, okay, so, right, I was just trying to remember back so that when it was probably in February that you had you had just done this mm -hmm. and got the results and felt that t they were accurate compared to the previous tool and so this is great I, it, but it is what I heard you saying earlier I think answering Jean's question maybe was um, but we need to be that this is long haul we're going to need to be focused on the growth, and then we would be. When would we be seeing the next um, uh, F and P? Is it Pontinus and Pinnell? Yeah, good. Uh, <laughs> assessment then uh, for the students. Would that be in September again? Yep, you'll get one in the fall. Um, usually September. They usually try to have them done by the first week of October, uh -huh. and then you'll get another one in the winter, and then you'll do another one three in the spring. Times a year. Right. So three so, times. A year. Well, the, the students, um, is it, would it generally be thought of that the students who, um, you know, have the highest level of need right now are getting part of the summer programs? Are, the, are those students who are, have a summer learning program or not? I don't know. We only provide summer programming for students who are eligible through their IEP. So would that over, is that the some case? Of them some may, of them may. Some, some may, okay. but may some not. may not. So, oh, it depends specifically right. on what the, the IEPs. IEPs dictate whether or not students we so provide I, services. This is, this is where the home connection right. really comes right. into play, right. where right. you want to make sure that the staff well, and myself 
are working together to say, look, in order to prevent regression right. for kids that are not on IEPs, these are the things that we are going to encourage families to do at home um, and send home the resources and materials that we want kids to be engaged with over the summer so we don't run into the regression that, right. that could end up happening. I can't remember. I know, so for the high school, it's been a while, right? The kids have, the students have uh, reading that they need, that they must do before the start of the year, or we used to. Summer reading. Uh, summer reading, but I can't quite remember how what, what it was like in elementary school, whether there was like the suggested reading list. There or... is. The they actually bring public library mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I just totally yeah. forgot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. I actually, I just, your line of questioning made me wonder if you'd ever look at the summer slide issue. Is that data you look at in September to say, you know, was there a population of students that have actually Yeah, we do. Yeah. That, that is part of the data that, that gets collected, and then we start to start from there um, about what are the what are the reasons that's happened. And there are some kids that actually get that might have left uh, at a certain point, and then we realize they need some extra help just to boost them back up from where they ended in the spring. Now I'm remembering. Yeah, read around the world, everything, the T-shirts, the whole thing for the summer. Do we ever? Do you ever look at data to see? If you know students who have participated in that program, do uh, definitely do better or have you know less regression, or we just haven't really collect, been able to collect that kind of data. Yeah. More, um, I mean, close in some cases when they get to fourth grade, you're still talking 30 to 40 percent of the kids are below grade level. Um, so we have work to do. Kids on IEPs, what's that 15 percent that's left? Yeah, how many kids are on IEPs? 16 percent. We're it depends upon the grade, but we're, the school wide, I think we're at 19 percent right now. That sounds right. Yeah, 19 to 20 percent. So it's still the results and you can sustain them over multiple years what you should see is those numbers getting smaller across the board but by the time they get to fifth grade yeah. it being a more reasonable number so that's there's a lot of reason for optimism in these right. numbers which is why just we historically if you look at the historical data the third grade the third grade scores compared to fourth grade compared to fifth grade the score continue to improve yeah anything else from the committee to say oh sorry. How do you decide who gets LLI intervention? Uh, we take the lowest um, percentage. The, the kids with the highest level of need, um, those are the students that, that get that. And how many do we have capacity to provide that service to? Um, well, right now we have 14 students. Um, so that's, that's what we have available to us. So it's, yeah, so it's not all the kids that aren't up to grade level. It's no. not even close. No. Yeah. It's a very, very small number. Well, we've said it before, but we will say it again. You're going to be greatly missed, but we are so appreciative of the work that you have done at Eaton the last couple of years. It has clearly had an impact, and I, I'm, I know that Lisa Marie is going to be taking over um, a really good foundation to build upon. So we are very grateful, and um, we're going to miss you, but we wish you well. Thank you. Have a good summer. Did, did we? I don't know if we got. If we didn't get this electronically, can I'll, we? I'll send you. I, yeah, we didn't get. It. Oh. I received it okay. a little bit later, and, so I'll, I'll and send in it. In the to Dropbox you. too would be great. Or just to get it to us electronically. I'll send it to you electronically. Okay. Are we ready to reorganize? Okay. Dr. Doherty. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, before I start the process, I, I just want to say uh, thank you to Ms. Borowski for her leadership this year as chair. Um, I've really enjoyed working with you in your capacity. Okay. I know it's been a very challenging year, as we, as we all know. <laughs> so I appreciate, I appreciate your leadership and support this year. Thank you. Likewise. So, uh, according to the policy, um, I will chair the first round of this, which is to select a for the committee to select a new chairperson. So I'm just going to briefly read right from your policy, BDA. Um, <clears throat> nominations for the office of chairperson will be made from the floor. The chairperson will be elected by a majority roll call vote of the members present in voting. If no nominee receives a majority vote, the election will be declared null and void and nominations will be reopened. And then the second part is once the new chairperson uh, takes, uh, takes over, then they you will go through the same process and elect a vice chair. So, um, do I have any nominations from the floor for chairperson? I'd like to nominate Chuck Robinson. Chuck Robinson, okay, do I have a second on that? Second. Any other nominations from the floor? Okay, hearing none, this probably will be easier than this part. <laughs> uh, all in favor of Mr. Robinson, let's do a roll, I'm sorry, we have to do a roll call vote. Uh, Mrs. Webb? Yes. yes. Dr. Doxer, Mr. Robinson? Yes. Ms. Borowski? Yes. Mr. Boyman? Yes. Mr. Nine. okay, congratulations. Mr. Robinson? Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Uh, you know, as Dr. Dari said, I too would like to thank Ms. Borowski. I mean, it was uh, a steady shift very um, difficult year. Um, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of different topics, and uh, you know, you you showed great leadership and poise, and and thank you for that. Thank you. So. Like, and as I've said before, for sitting here, I mean, this this uh, in my my opinion, I think others is. The first among equals, yeah. uh, and uh, you know everyone's uh, input and voice is important, and you know, we'll, we'll continue that. Uh, having said that, uh, I'd like to take nominations for uh, vice chairman, chairperson, I should say. Mr. Boivin. I would nominate uh, Elaine Webb. Second. 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 Any other nominations? Seeing none, uh, we'll close nominations uh, and a roll call vote for this. Uh, Mr. Nyan? Yes. Mr. Bob? Yes. Ms. Borowski? Yes. Dr. Yes. Dox? Yes. Congratulations. Appreciate the support from the committee and I'm sure. Um, it would be nice to think that this coming year might not be as challenging as last year, but I'm pretty sure that it will be the same <laughs> more. <laughs> more. So thank you. Uh, we have uh, liaison. Uh, liaison assignments. Uh, That, is that just one? It's person? just, it's That's just your, my, slide. Yeah. your slide. And I, I've done that, and I think it's time for you know, somebody else to, to do that. So uh, they meet uh, probably three times a year, I'd say, uh, roughly, unless there's something else going on. But it's an important, very important uh, role. Uh, and not every town has an audit committee, so it's a... It's a uh, Strictly a you know financial review committee, and um, Ms. Borowski's also on. Yeah, the school committee has two liaisons to the audit committee, and I can certainly um, agree with you. The time commitment compared to some of the others is much less. It's only a couple of times a year, but it is important work. Um, and 
Chuck and I have certainly, if he can't make a meeting, I go and vice versa. So it's also the kind of thing that can be very easily shared. So I can't volunteer because I'm already doing it, but <laughs> it's, it's a good assignment. If there's no one else, I can certainly take that. I, I currently serve on RACASA as a parent liaison and, a, and the vice president of RACASA. <coughs> So I know that's not on our list, but I, can, I think I can certainly um, pick up the honor and would like to, to do that. I, it's not a role that I, a liaison role I had ever done, so unless someone else had a burning desire for it. So someone want to make oh, a motion? Oh, do you want me to do that? Sure. Yeah. Um, move to uh, appoint Elaine Webb as the school committee liaison to the audit committee. Sir. Sec for a second. Yeah. All those in favor? Five, zero. Six zero. I should say. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, how many appointments do we have to the Recreation Committee? Just the, the you have all the ones that have 2017 are the ones you have to. Yeah. So I think it's the slot that I've had. Yeah. I'm up. Um, I love serving on the rec committee, and I would be happy to continue. But if anybody had a desire to do it, um, it's it's if you're interested in sports and, and and field usage and some of that stuff, it's really interesting. So this is one that I'm happy to continue to do. But if anyone would like it, I'm more than happy to step back from it. I have a, I have a question because sure. we're going to get to the CPAC, and I know there's some desire for um, <clears throat> some kind of rotation of the CPAC liaison not per meeting, but um, I'm glad to continue with that. But I also know you have a specialty with special ed, and I didn't know if that might be of interest to you. Um, I'm fine either way. I don't know if anybody else is interested, but because we have to share, yeah. I just thought it would be good to discuss that. I don't know if that's something else that's of interest to you I'm kind of I'm fine either way I would defer to you <laughs> so but we're not appointing oh, yeah. anyone oh, to CPAC tonight that's right oh, you're right so you're right just her yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just okay. yeah. Yeah. you got me <laughs> uh, is there any nominations oh, I'll nominate Jean unless she's unless they're I didn't hear you. anybody else with the burning desire so I'll nominate <laughs> thank Jean. you is there a second all those in favor? Thank you, Jean. Thank you. And uh, the Human Relations Advisory uh, Committee. Um, I know Dr. Doster wants to, would like to retain, remain on that. So. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I can make that motion. Great. Thank yeah. you. I'll second it. All those in favor? Six zero. Okay, this is uh, the Arcasa. That's a roll light, and I just I've had trouble uh, getting there. Uh, I'm, I'm working up a lot more up in New Hampshire now, and just getting down there for five thirty. So. Uh, I'm Somebody else would. So you Chuck talked to me about potentially doing it, so I'd be willing to volunteer to take that role. Great. Thank you. I would uh, nominate Gary Nyan for that. Second. Excellent. We meet 5:30 to 6:30, so it is a little bit yeah. early. It's a hard. It's and it's a it's committee that does well. I don't have to tell you does great work. And Erica does a fabulous job organizing. Action. Yes, she Erica does. And Tom Zaya and Julianne DeAngelis. So yep. they make it easy to be on the board, but it's just getting to the meeting can be challenging. Is there, is we already second yep. as a vote for Dr. Nyan? Is that an immediate start? I think so. Okay. It says September. Well, it says September 30th, but I, I, I didn't know if it was an immediate I'd start. I'd say immediate. Okay. Actually, it would, it would be, because we've already had our last. No, we have one more. Yeah. We have one more coming up. That's right in June. And uh, our current liaison to the 
our CTV Board of Directors is in the audience. Did you want have did you want to speak to that or Dave? Thank you. This I think you all know me, I'm John Carpenter. Uh serve on your board. Oh, this one's still working. No, that that's uh, just that's a recall. <laughs> Such technology. <laughs> Carpenter, as I said, served on this board for three years. Uh, uh, toward the end of that time, uh, some things were happening with uh, RCTV, and I got involved with it. So they said, okay, John, you be the, the representative. And I've been the representative with one about six-month interruption ever since. Um, the board has seen fit to uh, put me on a different slot still on the board of directors and we're looking to uh, the school committee to select another education representative to the RCTV board. Uh, what that involves is about 10 meetings a year plus subcommittees if you're on one plus showing up to show support as a board member for the activities of, of the station and the uh, uh, its various functions um, and there's going to be a little bit more time commitment now with the uh, 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 renegotiation of the cable contracts and we're going to need all the help we can get so that's basically what the next uh, volunteer for this spot uh, <coughs> should expect and yeah please find somebody who will commit to showing up at the meetings it's been a pleasure and a privilege, and uh, I'm still working with RCTV, and will always have education in mind. Uh, my first career, and uh, uh, I hope you have a candidate in mind. Thank you. So uh, I guess we can either decide whether there's somebody on this committee that wants to do that, or uh, like. Mr. Carpenter point someone out in the community that's interested. So uh, I guess I'd ask first if there's anyone on this committee that's interested in filling that as, as Mr. Carpenter just described. I'd be interested in being involved, especially with the contract being renewed this year. Um, that would be something that I'd be interested in learning more about and maybe I could be Another voice to participate. Thank you. Learn Thank a little you. more. Yeah. Good way to meet people, too. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Uh, move to appoint Nick Blavin as the school committee liaison to the RCTV Board of Directors. Second. All those in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next meeting is uh, next Monday. <laughs> yes. Right. Actually, there is um, some important um, RCTV meetings coming up, some focus groups. I was wondering if Mr. Carpenter might like to say something oh, yes. this, about this. Yes, this is So I didn't know if it's too late for people, if they hear about it on this, to contact RCTV to get involved. Or Anyone who's interested and concerned, uh, we'll find a place for you. Uh, and we're going to need your support as we negotiate the contracts. The purpose of these meetings is a needs assessment. The, and part of the, how this started was last time uh, in, the, in the negotiations, one of the cable companies challenged us that some of the things we were asking for, we didn't really need. So by having community support and community expression of what various parts of the community do really need, uh, we can either eliminate that discussion or, or, or have a valid response. And that's why the meeting. It's not about RCTV. It's about the cable TV contract for the town. Thank you. Is 
Thursday? I don't think so. It's a little rough to be here. You're going into <laughs> executive session. Um, I'd like, uh, we, uh, we will be moving into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to uh, collective bargaining and will not be returning to open session. We need a, a roll call vote. Uh, yes. 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 What? Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.